and I'd like to do a demonstration here of multiplexing. So what we have here are two digits, and at this point they look like they're both on solid. What is happening in reality is they are actually blinking very quickly back and forth. This number two will remain static throughout this entire demonstration. It is a an arbitrary fixed value that I put into that digit, and the zero will change as I increase the delay for each of these displays, essentially the time that this display is on and the time this display is on will increase along with the time that they're off. So the, there's essentially a 50% duty cycle when this one is on, this one is off, and vice versa. What we're looking at currently is something called persistence of vision. Essentially our eyeballs, and in this case also the camera, are essentially fooled because it is blinking faster than we can process it. And the camera has a sample rate that will kind of mess with things as, as we go forward here in, in um, changing the delays. So when I change this switch, what will happen is the delay will increase um, by a factor. So essentially the first one will change it by 16 milliseconds, 32, 64 milliseconds, and roughly 128, up to about 240 milliseconds total per display as they blink. So I'm going to turn on the first one, and as I'm standing here, it's blinking. I can tell that it's blinking. The camera, however, is fooled, and so I will change that to a 2, and now it's starting, the camera's starting to pick it up. It becomes very apparent as I'm standing here, but the camera is what we have. So now with three, so roughly 48 milliseconds per, it's uh, starting to show up on the camera as well, and it's kind of blinking back and forth. If I go to the next one, with four, now it's very apparent even for the camera that something's going on, and I can increase this as I see fit. So let's make it a six, and now it's very obvious that they're blinking back and forth, and Let's make it instead 8. So now it is very obvious. And if I go all the way to F, we're at roughly 240 milliseconds of delay per display, and it's just blinking back and forth. So essentially the data, which is here, is being presented to both displays, and then on this buffer, this transistor and this transistor are alternately being turned on, allowing this display to turn on and off as we see fit. And that is the physical part. Now let's take it apart and see what's happening under the hood. Now that we've seen the circuit in action, let's actually dig into it a little bit and see what's happening under the hood. So the first thing we want to do it note is that these are actually multiplexing and it's as I slow things down in terms of the delays between which display is on and which display is off this becomes pretty clear but here in this scope capture this is the one millisecond delay where this is the minimum delay I have implemented and you can see from the channel selections and these are just the enabled patterns from that are going into the base of the transistors that when one is on, the other is off, and vice versa. However, there is a small delay where both are off, where essentially the data is being set up and presented, and then the next step is to turn on the display of interest. And this is happening in this case from transition from the channel one, the first display, and channel two, the second display. And the same rules apply on the other ones as well. Now, we can slow down that delay. And in this case, this is the 16 millisecond delay. So this is the first step when I start playing with the switches. And you can see that the rules are still happening. It's one is on, the other is off, and vice versa. However, you can also notice that 
the delays are not exact, and that is going to get worse as we slow things down even more. And here it's 32 milliseconds, and you can see now it's 32 and a half milliseconds from the time on and time off delays. And then once we get to 64 milliseconds, we could almost cross that out and say it's 65 milliseconds, really. Um, and so that's kind of a, you know, software design issue. And in this, for this demonstration, it doesn't matter a ton. However, if we care, we have to address it. And then I talk about in over here, possible remedies. So we can either tune that one millisecond dis delay so that it's a little more accurate and tight. Uh, another option would be to actually create a second lookup table, and we are allowed to do that, where the switches would determine what value is going to get loaded into the timer. That timer value is tuned up a little bit so that we have a minimum of error, and we can get the delays we want. And finally, let's walk through the hardware schematic. So a lot of this is familiar fare. We have our buffers that we've been using all semester, and one of them is driving the seven segment displays or the seven segments on the displays, and the second buffer is just driving the transistors. Now notice there has to be a current limiting and resistor for the base in both cases, and we've talked about this in a previous lecture, where, remember, this is 5 volts, and the base emitter is going to be 0 0.7 volts. Therefore, something has to drop the rest of that voltage. That, that thing that's going to drop the rest of that voltage are these 2.2K resistors. That will provide plenty of current for the base, so these are well into the saturation range and are very much on and will conduct just fine. Now we could have used one set of resistors for the current limiting resistors for the seven segment display. So in other words, one set of these could have been placed over here and then fanned out to the displays. I chose not to do that, partially because I wanted to make this adaptable for other things if I decide to change the hardware setup. That's really pretty much it. And then over here I've just marked off all the connections. And you'll notice like, for example, P0, port 0, bit 7 goes nowhere. Port 2, bits 2 through 7 also go nowhere. Only 2, 0, 2, 1 are actually controlling our transistors. And down here is port 3, and this is our selector for essentially determining what values we're going to read in. And if the switches are open, these float high because I'm writing 1s to this port. And when it reads it back, it'll get a 1. And then if the switch is closed, it will pull it to 0. And we'll see a ground. And that's pretty much it. Now let's take a look at the actual software implementation. So let's take a quick walk through what the program does under the hood. So. I've posted this and is available online if you want to look at it in person and play with the text editor. But yeah, let's let's get started. So the first part is just documentation, explanation of what's happening, and then I've declared some variables and I've created four. So how does this work again? This is my variable name and I am equating that variable name with this as a memory location. So memory location 40 in RAM is counter, 41 is index, and so on. Our initialization is our kind of our one-time run. So the first thing we're going to do is we need to set the timer mode. Since I am implementing one millisecond delays and I would like the flexibility of the 16-bit timer, I want to set timer, timer 0 into mode 1. I'm not using timer 1, so I'm not going to set the mode. I could optionally set it to timer mode 1 as well, so this would be 11 hex instead of 0, 1. I initialize counter and index to 0. They're going to be changing pretty regularly, so I just want to make sure that they're zeroed out before I do anything else. 
index two is going to be the digit that doesn't change, as you saw in the demonstration, and I arbitrarily just put the number two there. As long as I put in a value there that is between zero and F, it doesn't matter. It could have been anything. It was just, I made a choice. Read delay is essentially the saved result from reading uh, port three and getting those four bits and doing things with them. So that's actually going to be, and it dictates how long our delay is between when each display is turned on and off. And here we're setting up the lookup table. So the data pointer is going to be pointing at the label that is called table, which rhymes. And here we're just turning off both transistors. So I've cleared both port 2.0 and 2.1, so those transistors are off, and the both displays are off. And by default, I don't care what port 0 is putting out because the displays are turned off. And we're going to change it soon anyway. Now let's get into the main module. So first thing we need to do is we need to determine how long are we turning the displays on and off. And to do that, we need to read port 3. So I am setting up port 3 for reading, and I just wrote all 1s to it. Technically, I could have also just written all 1s to the upper nibble, the upper 4 bits. I'm then taking that data from the port, bringing it into the accumulator, our storage, and then I am doing a bitwise AND with the accumulator. So now I have masked out the lower four bits, so they're going to be zero, and only the upper four bits from whatever it is I read in the previous step will remain. And then I make a copy. So now I have a, a version of it that I can recall, or and if I choose to mess it up later in the accumulator, I can just bring it back and it's fine. Now I perform a swap. So now the upper and lower nibble have been switched. So the upper nibble has zero because of the previous step up here. And the lower nibble now has whatever the upper nibble had. So it's the contents of read delay in the lower nibble. And that value is then going to be put into index, which makes it follow what the delay is. And that's how come as I change the index, the number changes along with it. Here we get our lookup table value. So essentially this is the arbitrary data pattern that will turn on the segments we want to make it look like the digit that we want it to be. So I created digits that are 0 through F. So I had to create a data pattern that met that need. I turn off port 2.1 because that is the other transistor, the second display transistor. Now, the first time around, up here, it's already off, and it's redundant, but that will be changing after the first loop. So essentially, I'm making sure it's off again this time, but on the second pass, it will be turned on and it needs to be turned off. And I'm trying to maximize the amount of time that that display is on before I have to actually transition to turn on the other display. Then I'm taking the accumulator, which has my lookup table value, and I am presenting that to port zero. So this line here is where that two microsecond delay, where both displays are turned off is actually occurring. So that's the instruction that's being executed while both displays are off. And then I turn this display on. So the first display is now turned on and we then have our digit presented and it's glowing. Although right now not a whole lot of time has elapsed because essentially this is, you know, one to two microseconds of time that it's been turned on. And then we do our delay. So that's what this delay is for the first digit. And first we do something that's called L call min loop. And I'm going to come back to min loop. So we do our display. So we have our timer display, our typical one millisecond timer delay. And notice counter is then kind of the thing that will dictate how many times we 
delay for one millisecond. Uh, yeah, one millisecond. So it will just loop here until counter runs out to zero. Now let's jump down to min loop. Min loop takes the read delay value that we had before, brings it into the accumulator. So essentially we took that value that we read from port three previously and made a copy of, and we're copying it back into the accumulator now. We don't have to worry about the lookup table data because it's sitting there on port zero, it's happy. And we're determining here at JZ is zero, we're looking to see if the accumulator is zero. And here's why we care about this. If we use DJNZ and counter equals zero, the count DJNZ decrement jump if not zero will decrement first. Therefore, we're going to have 255 iterations, 256 really, before that loop terminates. We don't want that. We just want it to loop once. So the idea here is if it's zero, if the accumulator equals zero, we're going to jump down here. And all I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, put a one into counter. That'll make it execute once. And then we return. If the accumulator is not zero, we're just going to take whatever value was in read delay and we're going to copy it right into counter and return. So if the number is zero, it equals one. If the number is greater than zero, just take whatever's in read delay and stuff it into counter. That's all that logic does. So let's come back to min loop. Oops, went too far. There we go. So if counter equals one, this will execute once because it will decrement and say, is it zero? Yep, it's zero, and it drops out. If it's 16 for the first digit, then, or for the first set of iterations, it'll do this 16 times and then drop out. That's all we want. Okay, let's move on to the other digit. So now, remember, digit one is still turned on. So now we're taking index two, the one that's just the arbitrary value, the number two, and we're just moving into the accumulator and getting our lookup table value. So this is going to really be pretty fixed in place in terms of what this data is going to be, but I could change index two to something else. I could have made it a different set of volatile data. I chose not to for the demonstration. We are going to then get that lookup table value. So this arbitrary data that I've already created, we're going to turn off port 20. So now the first display transistor is turned off. We're going to present the new data to port 0 and turn the transistor back on. So now the other display is enabled and we'll be showing the number 2. And then we just have our delay loop again. And I noted as I went through and documented this that I could have made this actually a little more compact by taking this chunk of code and turning it itself into a subroutine. So I decided to just leave it. But yes, efficiency programs can be improved over time. So min loop is called again. We're doing the same task there. We're just saying, hey, is the uh, our red value from port three, is that zero or not? If it is, then counter equals one, and if it's not, it equals whatever our delay value is. And then loops through, comes out, and then we go back to the top. So now we have 2.1 high, and we go back to main, and we start this process all over again. Now I'm reading, I'm reading the switches, I'm re loading, in re loading read delay with a value, getting my index one set up, getting the data, in the event it changed from the previous read, turning off to one, so now it's off, and we repeat that process. And that happens forever until power is removed. All right, we've looked at min loop, the subroutine, because that was 
kind of new. And then here's our timer delay. So this is pretty much what we've done the entire time when we've when I since I introduced timers where we clear our timer flags, we load that value, we start that timer running, we wait here and do nothing until that timer overflow flag becomes true, that's TF0, and when we're done we clear them out again. And yes, these two are redundant and could be removed as an option. And finally, let's take a look at our lookup table. So first of all, we do not ever, ever, ever really want to have program flow to drift into our lookup table. These values exist in program memory. Therefore, they will be executed as if they were opcodes. Opcodes means instructions to the computer. So essentially, it will attempt to execute them. Normally, that's not desirable you probably shouldn't let that happen. So all I'm doing here is this is just documentation so I can keep track of everything as I built up these data patterns. And you can see it's not in the first program I posted about lookup tables. It's not A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Some of these got swapped around because of wiring. So I solved all that just with the wiring. I solved the wiring issue by changing it in software. So there are ways to get around little problems. And again, FF should never occur and is left there just as an artifact from testing. And that's the end of the program.